This is the Bible with Nikki and Pippa Gumbel, Express Version, Day 188. The Dangers of Pride Back when I was working as a lawyer, I remember a very straightforward case that I thought I was bound to win. I was so confident, I decided it was not worth even bothering to pray about it or commit it to the Lord. When I stood up to speak, the judge asked me whether I was aware of a case that had changed the law in the last few days. I was not. The result was a very humiliating defeat. As the passage in Proverbs today warns, pride had come before a fall. In my humiliation, I cried out to God for help. I read the recent case. Then I wrote an opinion saying I thought the decision was wrong and would be reversed on appeal. Thankfully, it was. We were able to go back to court and win the case. The solicitor, rather than judging me for my mistake, was kind enough to be impressed by the opinion I'd written and sent me many more cases. So it became a double lesson, not just about the dangers of pride, but also about the extraordinary grace of God and how things work out when you trust in God. I try not to forget the lesson I learned about the dangers of pride and self-reliance whenever I stand up to speak. I'd like to say I've never made the same mistake again, but it's a lesson that I've had to relearn several times. In English, the word pride can have a good sense. For example, we would not say it's wrong for a person to be proud of their children or to take pride in their work. However, when the Bible talks about pride, it means something different from this and has very negative connotations. It means to have an excessively high opinion of one's own worth or importance. It suggests arrogant or overbearing conduct. It is the independent spirit that says, I have no need of God. Arguably, therefore, it is at the root of all sin. How should we respond to the temptation and dangers of pride? From Proverbs 16 Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers, and blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. The wise in heart are called discerning, and gracious words promote instruction. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Cultivate humility. God wants you to learn to walk in humility and kindness, not arrogance and pride. Pride comes before a fall. First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. We're reminded that it's better to live humbly among the poor than to live it up among the rich and famous. A lack of power is very frustrating at times when we think we know how best to advance the kingdom of God. However, Jesus had very little power from a human point of view. He was lowly in spirit and among the oppressed. Lowliness of spirit, the opposite of pride, brings first prosperity. Humility means being willing to learn. Those who give heed to instruction prosper. Second, happiness. The humble trust in God. Whoever leans on, trusts in, and is confident in the Lord, happy, blessed, fortunate is he. Third, healing. As opposed to the arrogant words of the proud, scoundrels plot evil and their speech is like a scorching fire. The humble use pleasant words. Pleasant words promote instruction. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Lord, help me always to stay dependent on you, to trust in you. New Testament from Acts 25 and 26 The next day, Agrippa and Bernus came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officers and prominent men of the city. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defence. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defence against all the accusations of the Jews, especially so because you're well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They've known me 
for a long time and can testify, if they're willing, that I conform to the stricter sense of our religion, living as a Pharisee. And now it's because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I'm on trial today. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the gourds. Then I asked, Who who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up, stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness to what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day, so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. Serve and witness. What should you do if you get the opportunity to testify about Jesus? How should you go about telling your story? We see in this passage a great example of what to do. Paul, on trial, tells the court that Jesus gave him a commission to serve. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness. As Jesus came not to be served but to serve, all of us are called to be servants and witnesses. A witness humbly points beyond him or herself. Paul humbly points to Jesus. Here we see how he fulfills this calling. Paul, in prison and on trial, comes face to face with pride and great pomp as he's brought before Agrippa and Bernice. It must have been a very daunting experience. Paul, once again, simply and humbly gives his testimony. He is polite and respectful to King Agrippa. He conforms to custom and social graces. He skillfully selects the parts of his story that are relevant to his audience. In the first part of his testimony, Paul uses I messages as opposed to you messages. Whereas you messages can seem arrogant and patronizing, I messages are sometimes more effective, as well as being a more unthreatening and gracious way to make a point. He says he used to be just like them. I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. I put many of the saints in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. The implicit message is, I was just like you. I was full of pride, power and pomp. I did what you are now doing. I persecuted Christians just as you are now persecuting me. He then tells how Jesus appeared to him and pointed out that in persecuting Christians, he was actually persecuting Jesus. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Jesus told him, I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. 
through this powerful eye message of his testimony, Paul is actually saying to them that they are in darkness and under the power of Satan in need of forgiveness of their sins. Not only does he point to their needs, he also points out the way to forgiveness. I preach that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. In effect, he's saying to these proud and powerful people, you need to repent and turn to God. He goes on, I have had God's help to this very day, and so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. Paul was willing to speak to everyone, to the powerful and to the weak. Paul's message was always centered on Jesus, who had appeared to him on the road to Damascus. He testifies that the Christ must suffer and rise from the dead. Lord, help me to take every opportunity to tell people about Jesus and to follow his example of humble service. Old Testament from 2 Kings 14 and 15 In the twenty-seventh year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. Resist pride. If, for example, you have anyone working for you, or if you are a parent, or if you are in any position of leading as a volunteer, you are in a position of power. Pride is a particular temptation for anyone in a position of power whether that power comes from status, success, fame, or wealth. The history of the kings of Israel and Judah demonstrates that it is extremely difficult to become powerful and resist the temptation to pride. During this period, the kings of Judah are doing rather better than the kings of Israel. King after king in Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord, while in Judah, Azariah and his son Jotham both did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Azariah is also known as Uzziah. We know something more about him from other parts of the Old Testament. Here we read that although he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, the high places were not removed. The Lord afflicted the king with leprosy until the day he died. Why did his life end in such a mess? The book of Chronicles gives the answer. His fame spread far and wide, for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God. This warns us that if God has blessed us with success, there is always a temptation to become proud. Lord, thank you for all the warnings in the Bible, as well as the encouragements. Help me always to take heed of these warnings. Lord, I am utterly dependent on you. Help me to keep my eyes always fixed on Jesus, who was all-powerful and yet humbled himself, made himself nothing, and took the nature of a servant. Pepper adds, Proverbs 16, verse 18. I once managed to get into rather a small parking space in one manoeuvre and was rather pleased with myself. I told my mother, who was in the car with me, that I was the best at parking in our family and resented the remarks about women not being able to park. Later that day, someone asked me if I'd go and pick something up in a bit of a hurry. So I jumped into the car with a friend and we returned to the same spot. And I tried to get into that spot. But could I? It took me five times to get into that spot and my friend was even offering to park for me. Serves me right. Pride comes before a fall.